going to start with a view of the Roman Forum because part of the activities of the Lupercalia Festival take place in the Forum itself, particularly along the Via Sacra. And this is what we're going to be considering today. February 15th is the Lupercalia Festival. We'll start with the protagonists and the context of the festival. We'll talk about it in the context of the Roman sources. That's not really the art that's going to give us an insight into the actual uh, details of the worship at the Lupercalia, but rather it's the ancient sources. So we'll be sure to talk about them. Then unwrap the ritual itself the locations in which the rituals are taking place, some fun imagery to take a look at from antiquity. Then the famous case, the most famous case of all I'd say from antiquity is the moment in which Julius Caesar is involved and he uses it as a staging moment to push his special status in Rome as a, let's say, would-be king in 44 BC. Remember, the Ides of March are around the corner. He's going to be dead on the 15th of March. This is then just before then by one month. And finally, how does this ritual that is so popular with the Romans end? We'll talk about how the final nail in the coffin is hammered in, but not as, well, you, you think it would, with the Christianity coming in with Constantine, it would have gone out of use but it actually has a much longer tradition. We go all the way to Pope Galatius. So let's take a look at the Lupercalia. First of all, the um, basic concept is that it's also taking place the time of a festival called Thebrua. And we think about fever, febris, febrile, with this term uh, Februa, which is a ritual of purification. And we get this name applied then to the whole month of February and associated with a particular deity, Juno Febralis, and we even have this term for the date as a Febrata. And that's the same day on which the Lupercalia is taking place. So why is there this fixation with the uh, idea of purification? Well, we already took a look at the entire month of February just recently in another live seminar. And a whole bunch of the activity of the month is focused around a nine day period, the Parentalia, in which this Lupercalia Fabrata is uh, encompassed. And we need to take a look at and consider the earlier calendar system of the ancient Romans, which is the original calendar was a 10 month system, a lunar calendar. And the first month of the year wasn't January, According to the Romans, it was March. So the last month, the month where you're kind of tying it all together, ending and looking forward to something new was not December as it is today. And as it was the case with the later reforms in the Roman calendar, it was the month of February. So that period of purification is very, uh, it just makes sense for the Romans and their own calendar system. The Lupercalia, of course, is going to have lots of associations going all the way back to the time of Romulus, being tied in even before Romulus to uh, the Greeks that are supposedly settling in there, according to a lot of Roman traditions. Evander, the Arcadian, and the Lycia is uh, a worshiping festival focused toward not Faunus, as is going to be the case for the Romans, but Pan, the Greek equivalent. And in that process, then, we're gonna be talking about Romulus himself and how he's the one, according to other traditions, that sets up this uh, ritual that's gonna focus around the point in the city where he is first with his brother suckled by the she-wolf. And it's gonna be maintained by Roman families, two distinct Roman families, which is the case of a lot of, a lot of other uh, ancient Roman rituals in the Roman calendar. And it's something that ultimately through the participation of these noble families, these wealthy families, these old families, their participation is going to then be the performance that leads to the well being of the entire community of Rome. Okay, so who are the protagonists? 
We have the Parentalia again from the 13th to 21st of February in which this is taking place. The she-wolf Romulus and Remus here depicted on the famous uh, altar from Ostia, now Museo Nazionale Romano. You see there at the bottom the she-wolf suckling the twins and Pan oftentimes in these kind of reliefs is present or Faunus, this a deity that we've also talked about being venerated in the month of uh, February on his first temple in the uh, Tiber Island. And Evander is a figure that looms large in the ancient sources. So he is also gonna be tied in to this, uh, this ritual. Uh, so you have some ideas projecting back uh, the Lupercalia even before the existence of Romulus and Remus and uh, giving it a nice tie to Greek ideas, faunus and associated with the Greek pan, Greek pan introduced by Evander. Evander who at other times in the life seminars we've talked about is the one that meets Hercules when he's on his own labors and passes through what will become the form board. Now you're gonna have as the main protagonist in this ritual, two groups of men originally from two uh, families, the Fabiani and the Quintiani, and each one is going to be affiliated with Romulus and Remus. And part of it is involved in the competition. These groups represent the original competition, the, uh, the, the, the vying in a competition between the two brothers. And as we know, in the end, from other contests, it's Romulus that's gonna beat Remus and found the city of Rome. But there's a part of ritual and competition in the Lupercelli as well. And there are big concepts. We're remembering the dead because I mean, that's a lot of what uh, you're having in the month of February. We're having this idea of purification. A lot of the idea is remembering the dead and going through ways of purifying the community and then the city and then the individual. And then we have some questions about fertility because that's gonna come up as well. And ultimately this idea that's always percolating kind of a common uh, misnomer that you know Valentine's Day is gonna take over Lupercalia. There's some sort of association going on there in, in popular theory. And we'll see that doesn't actually prove to be the case. Okay, so the sources are Cicero writing the time of the, um, of the famous moment when Mark Antony is trying to crown uh, Julius Caesar in the forum. The Dionysus of Halicarnassus and Ovid are uh, going to be Augustan authors. Plutarch's obviously going to be a bit later at the end of the first century AD and into the second century AD. And he has a great account in the life of Romulus, one of my favorites. And then we can go into later sources, uh, including Suetonius, Life of Caesar, who's gonna also talk about that moment of time in which Julius Caesar is trying to be crowned uh, symbolically. So the ritual. The ritual involves the Vestal Virgins, the Flamen Dialis, and these sodalitates, these groups of uh, selected individuals uh, from society. And the Vestals will uh, make a sacrifice, the Flamen Dialis is there as well, uh, overseeing a lot of the rituals. But what happens is you're sacrificing a goat, you're sacrificing a dog. And when the sacrifice is ended, you're going to wipe the bloody knife on the forehead of these sodalitates members, two groups of 12. And afterwards, the knife is wiped off with milk and wool and, as well for the, um, off the forehead. The blood is coming off the forehead. But the, the response and, and getting your face wiped with blood is to respond with laughter. So there's some sort of ritual, there's some sort of um, function. We don't know if the laughter is warding off, uh, you know, bad luck or evil eye or whatnot. But after this ritual is taking place at the Lupercal, and we'll see what that is on the Palatine Hill, the exact location is still unknown and undiscovered. But then you're gonna have a race. You're gonna have running up and down on the Via Sacra, actually naked. And you're gonna be whipping a lot of the crowd that gap gathers with the whips that are constructed out of strips of skin from the sacrificial goat. So there's all kinds of things that are going on in different locations. And, and a lot of the questions in his interpretation is the, uh, is this happening to do with shepherding because you know, the, the Ramish and Remus are shepherds and then you know, they're suckled by the she-wolf, but then here's that dog, the dog is sacrificed. Why is the dog sacrificed? Because the dog is the enemy of uh, the wolf, we're here in some way satisfying or remembering uh, the she-wolf that suckled uh, the twins. So we have a lot of different ideas uh, coming on here, uh, this competition between the brothers, uh, not just athleticism, but also just 
you know, various sources are telling us they're running down the Via Sacra, they're running around the Palatin Hills, another uh, kind of interpretation from other ancient authors. So is it also a kind of protective boundary that's being created by that running? A lot of different questions are, are being asked in the scholarship. And of course, uh, we do want to think always about this original idea of purification at the end of the year, and you are doing something for the benefit of the community. A uh, whipping, it can be seen also as purification, not just as fertility, which is, it seems to be a later introduction, a later uh, idea that's introduced in terms of the interpretation of these men going around, thwacking their little whips, and then uh, some women uh, stand out to get hit, and in the hopes of, of, of becoming pregnant, that kind of theme is introduced also into the sources. So there are a lot of different interpretation of what's going on here. We are looking at a couple of images. We're looking at the Vestal Virgins. We're looking at the Flamin Dialis with this little hat. And of course, the Capitoline She-Wolf with Renaissance twins added beneath. Okay, what locations are we talking about? Well, the loop recall itself in the Ficus Ruminalis, this fig tree that, tree that grows up spontaneously by the cave where the She-Wolf is suckling the twins is somewhere at the base of the Palatine Hill near where we have uh, the Circus Maximus underneath the House of Augustus. Uh, we're gonna have the running on the Via Sacra in the Forum. And then another fixed point, it seems, is another ficus, another fig tree that grows up. This one's in the Forum by the uh, Rostra. So this seems to be, to, according to some scholarship, the end run on the Via Sacra. Uh, you're, you're coming in from the Palatine Hill and the Vicus Tuscus, uh, from one Ficus Ruminalis at the Lupercal, you're coming into the form, and the end result is at the Via Sacra base at the uh, Rostra with the Ficus Nivea, another fig tree. And, uh, and of course, that's where the Rostra is, and that's where ultimately in the age of uh, Julius Caesar, that's where he'll be seated to be crowned. Here's a scene from the Arapacus. Here's that same image from the altar from Osti Antica, which is now in Museo Nazionale Romano. So we want to think about these important locations, we'll actually take a look at them now. So here's the Palatine Hill. There's an arrow indicating somewhere in that corner where there was the Lupercal still to be discovered. Some people thought they discovered it in 2007, but it's probably just an underground Nephaeum. But it is basically just below the House of Augustus and the Temple of Magna Mater, basically by St. Anastasia Church. Now we have the Rostra here labeled, that's a reconstruction, but it is the basically Imperial Rostra of Julius Caesar and Augustus. And we have the Ficus Navia that was somewhere in the center of the Forum Piazza. Here it is depicted on the Anaglyph at Triani, which is now located inside the uh, Curia. Next to, on the right, there's a famous statue of Marcius also in the center of the, uh, of the uh, Forum Piazza area. So that fig tree was there. It was, a, it was a fixed point. It was a fixed tree. And when it died, they replanted it and up would come another one. So it really was tied to the... Uh, the longevity and the success of Rome. If it died, it was a bad omen, you planted another one and so forth. But these fig trees tied into this concept of the uh, fecundity of the she-wolf, Acalarentia, and, uh, and this uh, idea of fertility. So that's always there overhanging the Lupercalia location and Lupercal uh, structure. Let's take a little walk down the uh, Via Sacra and think about naked Mark Antony running down here in 44 BC and countless other Luperci that are running around and then flicking their whips and hitting various spectators who are literally on the Via Sacra or heading down toward the Forum Piazza. Obviously the structures to the right here, there's the vestibule leading into the Forum of Peace of Vespasian. These are much later uh, structures. There's the Temple of Faustina and uh, Antonius Pius. So not there in the time of Julius Caesar, but right to the left, on the left side there, there was the Domus Publica. That's where Julius Caesar lived as the Pontifex Maximus until the day he died. But it's just, I think, fun to just imagine for a moment that reality, all that history that took place on the Via Sacra. Obviously this is modern pavement. There's some more original pavement uh, further down, just to think, there's so much history that took place on that street, the Via Sacra. Okay, Julius Caesar and the Lupercalia in 44 BC, he's adding a third group, a third uh, companionship uh, called the Luperci Luliani. Mark Antony, the consul at the time, is one of them, basically running around butt naked uh, and uh, comes down and then ultimately tries to crown uh, Julius Caesar before the crowd in the forum 
the crowd boos each time he uh, tries to crown Julius Caesar and Julius Caesar refuses, the crowd cheers more and more and more. So basically it's saying on the part of the, of the people of Rome, we don't want a king. Julius Caesar, no, don't take that diadem. And, uh, it, but it seems to have been a publicity stunt to see, well, how far can we push this? You know, maybe everyone will cheer when he's crowned. Uh, he was just an officiator in the spectacle. He's not running around butt naked. But um, here's, a, here's a fun little image of that uh, kind of moment with the teeming masses behind. How about some images of Luperci? Here's one, a monument of Claudius Liberalis, which is now in the Vatican Museums. And you can see this particular, I think, equestrian order a gentleman. Uh, one of the great moments of his political career is being Lupercus. There he is. He's got a little loincloth and he's got his whip in his hand. This is drawn, by the way, by my little 12 year old. Uh, if you need any artistic uh, renderings of famous uh, monuments or whatnot, uh, be sure to let me know and I'll pass on her information. Uh, this one here is actually a terracotta compound relief plaque that was found near the House of Livia on the Palatine Hill at the end of the 19th century. And what you see here again is something very rare. These guys are naked. One, two, three, four guys, and some of them have their whips in hand. So this is the kind of stunning evidence that comes from ancient Rome that corresponds with the ancient sources and the description of these people. And you think about the primitive culture and you think about that kind of perpetuation of that. If Romulus and Remus are running around naked, competing as, as they did in the, in the Greek world, as they did the, the, the ancient gods, well, so too can we be part of that primordial of Rome or even at the time of Evander, if you follow other traditions and participate for the well-being of the community. How does it all end? Well, it's still mentioned the Lupercalia in the calendar of 354, which has Christian and pagan, uh, non-polytheistic uh, traditions uh, are recorded in that calendar already in the middle of the fourth century AD. Even though all rituals are banned at the end of the fourth century, we still have it going down until it's shut down by Pope Galatius I at the end of the fifth century uh, AD. Absolutely incredible that this was something that was so felt and of course has to do with the well-being of the community. This is one that held on for quite a long time. And let's just remember and underline the fact that there really is no tie uh, between the Lupercalia and then Valentine's Day, this saint that's martyred in the third century AD. In fact, there are other ones with the same name uh, that comes to take its place on the 14th of February. Lupercalia, February 5th, uh, 15th, a very striking, unique, uh, interesting and engaging a festival. We still have a lot to discover about this incredible Roman ritual.